Uh, we are really excited to have Dr. Elizabeth Reddington. She will be talking to us about managing multiple demands in the adult ESL classroom, a conversation analytic account of teacher practices. Uh, she is a, Dr. Reddington is a proud graduate of Applied Linguistics from Teachers College, um, she, where she received her um, Doctor of Education. She's also the newest member of our faculty. She is currently the adjunct assistant professor in the Applied Linguistics and TESOL program. And as an ESL instructor and as a teacher educator, she is particularly interested in using conversation analysis to examine classroom interaction to gain insight into relationships between teacher practices, student participation, and the creation of language learning opportunities. Her work has appeared in peer reviewed journals such as Classroom Discourse, International Journal of, of hum Humor Research, and Linguistics and Education. So at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Reddington. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm going to get my screen set up here. And let's see. All right, can everybody see my slides? OK. All right, so I just want to thank everybody again for, for coming. Um, I'm looking forward to um, sharing my work with you today and uh, also to your, your questions and, and comments and, and feedback at the end. Uh, so this project um, is very much uh, or very much stems from my, my own experiences as an adult ESL instructor and also more recent experiences I've had in working with uh, novice teachers. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in the question of sort of what constitutes the work of teaching. And that's not only in the sense of, um, you know, how do we plan a lesson and, and design tasks, but also in the sense of um, as teachers interact with their students or, or how do teachers interact with their students in real time? How do they accomplish their goals as they're um, working with students in the classroom? Um, so that's kind of the the starting point of my of my interest um, in this in this project. And in fact, there's there's actually relatively little agreement on what constitutes the work of teaching in the teacher education literature. Um, so, you know, what constitutes those core practices um, and tasks that any uh, novice teacher um, might need to do. Uh, so there's a real need for studies of actual classrooms um, that might be able to offer us uh, pedagogically useful descriptions of practices that would benefit uh, novice teachers and teacher educators. And I would say there's also a need for more studies of adult ESL classrooms. Um, this is a, a population that um, historically has been um, has received less attention in the literature. Um, and that's in spite of the, the, the growth of the immigrant population in the United States. Um, so, so these are all factors that uh, formed uh, my motivation in undertaking this study. And the question that I ask specifically is, what discursive practices do experienced teachers use to manage multiple demands in adult ESL classrooms? And by discursive practices, uh, I mean, the, the talk and other communicative resources that teachers might use in recurring ways um, in order to accomplish different actions in the classroom. And I want to unpack this idea of managing multiple demands a bit more as well. So if we look at the, the theoretical and the empirical literature on teaching, there is often reference to the fact that teachers must attend to multiple demands or multiple concerns in the classroom. And I think that's captured uh, very nicely in this quote um, taken from Holland Smotrova's work. Uh, so they write, in their interactions with students, teachers must manage multiple activities and goals simultaneously. At the very least, they must coordinate their actions in ways that maintain order as they instruct, ensure that students are attending to the instructional 
instructional task and encourage student participation. So these concerns have been, I think, sort of usefully categorized uh, by Wright in his work on classroom management. And he talks about um, kind of three uh, areas of concern. So the first being managing order, uh, managing learning opportunities, and managing care. So care would, would be attending to the, uh, the interpersonal and emotional aspects of, of the classroom. Um, and we can see here kind of a, a snapshot of, of some of the literature that, that captures um, these demands and, and the fact that teachers do attend to them and also how they do it. So what are some of the practices through which teachers manage these demands? Uh, however, with some exceptions, this work tends to foreground one demand or another. Uh, so there's actually less work, less empirical work that seeks to examine specifically how teachers manage multiple demands. Uh, so I think that presents us with a couple of, of avenues that, um, that I wanted to explore in, in this study and that I think are, are worth continuing to explore. And the first is, how might a particular teacher practice attend to multiple demands? And uh, we do have some uh, examples of, of work like this in the literature. So um, I'll mention a, a, reach, a recent study by Lowe examining uh, how a teacher attends to both affiliation and instruction in responding to student tellings. Um, another area that I think is, is worth examining and, and considering is what a particular practice might accomplish for different students. So recognizing that the teacher, even when um, interacting with an individual, um, is always accountable to the rest of the class, the rest of the group. Um, so what might a practice do for different students? And we do have uh, some work along the, these lines as well. Um, I, I can mention St. John and Cromdale's study um, examining how teachers either alternately or simultaneously address uh, a single questioner, single student, and the other students in order to prepare everyone for the task uh, at hand. So I think these are, are some questions that, you know, that I wanted to explore and also that I think are, are worth continued, uh, uh, continued uh, examination. Uh, so let me give you some more details on um, the method of the study, the, the research sites, the participants, and, and how I went about collecting the data and uh, analyzing it. Uh, so I uh, collected data at two uh, different research sites. These were two different adult ESL programs. Uh, and I recruited uh, teachers who were experienced instructors. So having at least five years of experience, um, although two of the teachers actually had over 30 years of experience. And I collected data um, by uh, setting up video cameras in the classroom. So I uh, brought in two cameras to capture two different angles uh, in each of the classes. And I recorded three class sessions for each instructor. So that gave me about 25 and a half hours of uh, recordings of, of classroom interaction. Uh, in preparing for analysis, I, I began transcribing um, the episodes of whole class interaction because I was interested in how the teacher was working with the students. And I uh, began conducting analysis according to the principles and techniques of conversation analysis. And uh, for those who are not um, familiar with conversation analysis, um, this is a method that has been used to study interaction in, in various contexts, uh, both everyday and institutional. And with the general goal of uncovering the tacit methods and practices of social interaction. Uh, so I thought this was a method well suited to, to what I wanted to do in this project, which, which was potentially to make uh, what might be unnoticed or largely unconscious teacher practices visible and explicit. And so that's what, what CA generally aims to do. Uh, CA is also known, um, as CERT puts it here, for its obsession with detail. Um, so uh, video and transcripts allow us to capture very subtle uses of both verbal and nonverbal or embodied resources. Um, so all of that can be taken into account uh, in the analysis. 
And finally, uh, conversation analysis is a bottom up method of analysis. Uh, so rather than come to the data with um, hypotheses or predetermined categories um, and coding that data, uh, the analyst should begin with the data itself and trying to um, identify patterns. And so this was essentially my, my process here and, and sort of the steps that I took uh, going from sort of unmotivated looking, just uh, reviewing the transcripts and videos just to see what I noticed, uh, to um, noting cases in the same class or in different classes that might be kind of similar. Uh, to building collections of those similar cases. And finally, analyzing each case in detail and also comparing it to others in, in the collection. So the idea is to try to arrive at a description of a practice that would fit those, those cases and, and have the right cases um, described under that practice. And I, I hope that this would allow me to uh, offer a, a, a kind of a fuller picture of teacher practices and, and as they're used in context by using this uh, analytic approach. So I ultimately identified and described three teacher practices in the data set for managing multiple demands. Uh, so in the, the major part of this talk, I'm going to walk through each practice um, using examples uh, from the videos and the transcripts. Uh, so the first practice um, I want to talk about is, is what I've called voicing the student perspective. And this is a practice where the teacher formulates the potential student perspective on a difficult or problematic aspect of a topic or a task. And what does this do? Um, I, I argue that it enables the teacher to affiliate with students to say, I can see this from your perspective, um, while also promoting engagement with those difficult topics and tasks. Uh, so I'll illustrate uh, first with just a brief example from, from a transcript here, and you can note the, uh, the highlighted part here. Um, so the teacher here is, is actually wrapping up explanation of one part of a grammar topic, and he's preparing to explain a second part. But note that in lines five and six there, um, rather than launching immediately into this explanation, the teacher first produces an assessment of it the second part maybe is a little bit more confusing. By anticipating, verbalizing, and in that way validating a potential student perspective on this topic, the teacher is able to affiliate with students. So, you know, it's, it's a means of communicating. I can see this uh, from your perspective. I know what it's like to be in your shoes. At the same time, the assessment here also functions as a kind of a heads up alerting students to the challenge ahead and preparing them to engage with that difficult contact. So with an utterance like this, the teacher can attend to both uh, interpersonal and instructional concerns. All right, so we can see here that in line four, um, which is the point at which the teacher could be expected to refer to item number five and elicit the next answer, uh, he instead produces an assessment that characterizes the final two items, numbers five and six, as a little bit tricky. So the teacher gives voice to a perspective that may well align with that of learners who are new to this topic, um, thereby validating that perspective and affiliating with students. Now, given its sequential position here, the assessment also functions as a special kind of elicitation. By acknowledging the, the trickiness of the items, the assessment both, uh, I would say, challenges the students to respond, but also makes it safer for them to do so. Uh, if the items are tricky, then mistakes might be expected. And in fact, we can see that uh, one student immediately takes up that challenge, uh, announcing in line six, I did it. And the teacher's go for it in line nine uh, seems to continue to communicate that this next item requires some special effort. And the student does get the tricky question wrong here, which uh, leads to the teacher providing some uh, further explanation. 
Uh, but is, what is most interesting for me here is how the teacher's assessment compactly expresses uh, solidarity with the students while also recruiting their participation. So encouraging them to take the risk of responding in spite of that difficulty. All right, so as the teacher shifts to a new pedagogic topic uh, there in line five, he also uh, produces or first produces an assessment that highlights the topic's difficulty, um, noting that one of the hardest things about adjective clauses is knowing which ones need a comma and which ones don't. Note that the assessment here is qualified. The topic is one of the hardest things for Americans, for native speakers. So by extension, the topic could be even harder for non-native speaker learners uh, like the teacher's students here. And in fact, the teacher goes on to provide evidence of the difficulty experienced by native speakers in lines 11 to 13, giving the example of, of his father, a writer and a magazine owner, who nevertheless had trouble with this topic. So by anticipating, and in this case, elaborating on the difficulty that students might experience with the topic, the teacher legitimizes that difficulty and affiliates with the students while also preparing them for the challenge ahead. Note, however, that here, the teacher does not allow one of the hardest things to stand as a final assessment of the topic. Having voiced the potential student perspective and having made it public in this way, the teacher has created a slot to respond to that perspective. Uh, so in lines 13 to 15, he proceeds to offer reassurance, predicting that after the class, students won't have trouble with the topic. And this prediction of success even gets upgraded to a promise in line 17. Uh, then in lines 22 to 24, the teacher produces one more assessment of the topic, um, now an account for that promise of success, uh, which now appears to convey his own perspective. Uh, he says, it, because it's actually a pretty simple idea when to use them, the commas, and when not. Voicing the student perspective initially and uh, playing up that challenge ultimately contributes, I think, to creating kind of a sense of intrigue around this topic. It's as if the teacher is about to let students in on a secret that they need to pay close attention to. Uh, so in articulating both a potential student perspective on topic difficulty, and in this case, a counter perspective, the teacher is able to both affiliate with students and promote their engagement in spite of those acknowledged difficulties. The second practice I'll talk about um, is one that I've termed binding student contributions. And this is a practice that involves the teacher marking a connection between student talk and either teacher explanation or other student contributions or aspects of other students' identities. And the connections are marked in, in various ways. So you'll see examples um, with discourse markers, expressions of similarity, uh, pronouns and other reference forms, and embodied resources as well. So use of gaze and gesture, for instance. And this is a practice uh, that enables the teacher to both attend to the individual, so to acknowledge uh, one individual's contribution while also promoting the understanding uh, and perhaps the participation of others in the group, uh, and also as well, potentially moving the lesson forward. So attending to the needs of the whole group while uh, focusing on, still focusing on uh, an individual student. So how does the teacher sort of, of balance this? And I'll start with, a, with just a brief example uh, with the transcript here. Uh, so in this, uh, uh, episode, uh, one student, Maya, has been engaged in a rather extended telling. And uh, just note how the teacher launches a turn in overlap with Maya in line seven. She says, so what you're seeing here that Maya pointed out, it's actually a replication. And she goes on to provide further explanation of replication. So this is a new vocabulary item for the class. But the insertion of that relative clause gives Maya credit for the example that she has provided 
while also creating a link between her example and the general concept that the teacher is about to uh, introduce and explain. So by connecting or, or binding student talk to the teacher explanation, uh, the teacher is here able to acknowledge that individual contribution, but also make connections for the benefit of the whole group's understanding of this ongoing discussion. So note that after sharing the initial example, Maya extends the topic in lines eight and 11 uh, she does not orient to the closing potential of the teacher's assessments and the and the yeah. Um, in line 12, the teacher then launches a new turn in overlap with Maya. And although she is here reclaiming the floor, she still refers to what Maya has just shared with the group. Uh, this is one begins to frame Maya's contribution as one of several possible counterexamples. Now, at the same time, another student, Emma, has bid non-verbally for the floor. You can see that in line 14. And so the teacher abandons her um, initial uh, turn construction unit, but nevertheless proceeds with marking a connection. So she gazes and gestures toward Emma um, as she produces either, and your husband is what, or and your husband is as well. Um, that's in lines 15 and 16. So the teacher's embodied orientation to Emma and the use of that and prefacing, uh, potentially an as well too, all serve to mark Emma's upcoming talk as connected to Maya's prior talk. So here the teacher is able to draw on her prior knowledge of an aspect of Emma's identity, that she's married to an academic who is also an athlete. And in doing this, the teacher is able to move the interaction forward. So onto a new speaker and onto a related point. So through binding, uh, she is able to both continue to acknowledge one student's prior contribution while simultaneously creating space for another student to participate. Uh, Hannah adds Korean to the list of, of languages that she's building. And at this point, the teacher who had been gazing toward and responding to Hannah now directs his attention to the Korean student in the group, Mina. So he turns and gazes toward her with his eyes open wide, eyebrows raised, and he also points toward her. Uh, the, this embodied conduct uh, marks a connection between a detail of Hannah's telling and an aspect of Mina's identity. And I think the, the suddenness of the teacher's movement and that exaggerated facial expression seem to suggest a kind of happy noticing of this connection, um, a nonverbal version of, did you get that too? And although it's not possible to see Mina's reaction in the recordings, it can be said that the teacher's conduct here is at least designed to engage Mina, who like the teacher and the other students has been in the more passive role of telling recipient here. They've been listening to Hannah. At the same time, by marking this connection through entirely embodied means, the teacher avoids overtly interrupting Hannah. Um, so note that he even quickly shifts his gaze back to her with a smile in line eight. And so in fact, it might be possible to view this uh, very brief engagement with Mina as supportive of Hannah's telling. So a move to ensure that um, students in the audience are, are continuing to pay attention uh, to the details of this, uh, of this student's story. As Hannah prepares to continue her telling, um, note that the teacher glances briefly once again at Mina uh, with a smile there in line 11. Uh, before returning his attention to Hannah, uh, who goes on to complete the telling. So in this case, then, we can see a teacher continuing to align with and respond to one student's extended contribution, uh, but at the same time, by non-verbally connecting this contribution to an aspect of another student's identity, the teacher is also able to acknowledge and attend to engaging other recipients. The last practice that I'll talk about, um, I've called resource splitting. And this is a practice uh, that involves the teacher using verbal and embodied resources to simultaneously pursue different courses of action within a turn or using 
different embodied resources to do uh, to do that. Uh, so there's this kind of um, division of, of labor, something that Kanta has talked about uh, between verbal and nonverbal, and sometimes between different um, embodied resources. Uh, so what does this practice enable the teacher to do? Um, on the one hand, it enables the teacher to uh, continue to align as a recipient of student talk and validate the contribution of an individual while pursuing various other actions, uh, which can include uh, maintaining order, promoting a more even participation, and moving the lesson forward. Uh, so I'll show first a, a kind of simple example here, um, just with the transcript and, and the picture. Um, here the class is checking answers to a textbook exercise. And note the splitting of verbal and nonverbal resources here in lines 10 to 11. Uh, as the teacher produces a verbal assessment of a prior answer, very good, uh, note that he's also gazing to the book and pointing to another student. So within a single turn, um, by dividing up those, those resources, he's able to accomplish several different actions, including giving uh, positive feedback to the prior speaker, preparing to read the next item, and allocating the next turn. All right, so we can see here that after some hesitation, Kara produces the response, they don't need to like judgmental in line seven. And she continues her explanation, um, producing another form of the word judged in line 11. Her response hints at a conditional relationship, something like don't judge others if you don't want to be judged yourself, but it doesn't precisely express the meaning of the proverb yet. Uh, now, the teacher has oriented to Kara's trouble in responding and moves to reclaim the floor. Uh, so notice in lines uh, 12 and 13 here, um, after, after Kara's pause and an overlap with, with her saying judged, the teacher takes an in-breath and begins pointing toward her. He continues with an evaluation, you're on the right track, which casts her response in a positive light as close to correct though not entirely adequate. Note, however, that as the teacher delivers this feedback and continues to point to Kara, he also shifts his gaze to the group. Um, and we can see that in line 14. So through this, this splitting of resources, the teacher simultaneously attends to and validates Kara's response while preparing to invite others to contribute. And he goes on starting in line 16, asking a more narrow question that um, opens up, reopens the question, uh, or reopens the topic to, to the group, um, ultimately selecting another student to respond. So in this extract, we can observe the teacher, uh, again, aligning as a recipient of one student's response, offering that validation verbally and non-verbally with the point, um, even as he simultaneously moves to disengage and reopen the floor. And that all happens within a single turn. So if we look at uh, lines uh, one to three, um, we can see that after describing the, the educational practices at the non-traditional school, um, Maya then states their, their purpose to raise, create, to raise creativity. Uh, she then provides an alternative formulation, um, hearable as uh, Boster creativity. The teacher orients to that non-standard pronunciation, offering two possible verbs to fit the phrase. Uh, she does that in line five, bolster and foster. And Maya repairs the phrase with the teacher's second suggestion, which is uh, foster creativity. Uh, she does that uh, in line nine. The teacher proceeds to do more than correct Maya, however. Um, she also endeavors to make this phrase an object of pedagogic focus for the whole class. So her positive assessment great in line 11, now we'll look down there, uh, not only validates Maya's repair, but also marks the phrase as worthy of note. And as the teacher utters this assessment, notice that she also stands and picks up her marker as seen in line 12. So this is the first instance here of resource splitting, the teacher aligning as a recipient of Maya's telling verbally and, and by keeping her gaze on Maya. 
And she also prepares non-verbally um, to pursue a separate course of action, writing that vocabulary item on the board. As Maya continues her telling in line 14, the teacher engages in further embodied resource splitting. So she keeps her gaze on Maya, continuing to align as a recipient while simultaneously stepping backward toward the board. So you can kind of see that in the illustration there, also in, in lines uh, 16, 16 and 17 and 19. Then verbal and nonverbal resources are directed to different courses of action. We see that in lines 20 to 21. After nodding at Maya, the teacher utters a stretched wow. And as she turns, so she's responding to the telling there, that's still responding to the telling, but she's also simultaneously turning to face the board. And she proceeds to write foster creativity. When she finishes writing, the, the Maya's telling is still in progress. So the teacher doesn't explicitly direct the class's attention to that phrase. Uh, she'll do that later on in the lesson. Uh, but the students telling and the main discussion activity are, are able to continue uninterrupted here while the teacher also pursues her agenda of providing instructional support by writing that phrase uh, on the board, making it clear and available to all students. So as a result of resource splitting here, introducing this uh, object of pedagogic focus is an entirely embodied project and that it, that it occurs in parallel with the verbal and sometimes nonverbal displays of recipiency and validation of a student's uh, extended and ongoing contribution. So uh, taking these three practices as a group and returning to Wright's conceptualization of the major concerns that teachers navigate in the classroom, this study has attempted to identify ways in which teachers can do these things, in which they maintain order, um, including by managing turn taking and moving the lesson forward, uh, how they manage learning opportunities, uh, including by promoting the understanding of ongoing talk and uh, pursuing student engagement, and also how they demonstrate care by validating contributions, by offering encouragement, and displaying personal knowledge of students and their backgrounds. Importantly, we can also see that the management of these concerns is it can very well be intertwined. So uh, zooming out, um, I think a key theme in the current study um, really is the complexity of teacher talk and recognizing that teachers can attend to various concerns simultaneously uh, within as small a space as a single turn or a single utterance. And I think it's valuable when doing classroom-based research to see teacher talk in this way as multivocalic or heteroglossic as, as Waring has put it. The study also makes a contribution to specifying practices uh, in the repertoires of experienced teachers. And I've looked at adult ESL instruction in particular but I think that the kinds of things that emerged would be relevant um, in other classroom contexts as well. So these are the kinds of practices that we might include when attempting to uh, articulate the components of a classroom interactional competence um, as Walsh's work has done. So by classroom interactional competence, Walsh is talking about the teacher's ability to use language to um, assist and mediate learning. Uh, his work is based on analyses of classroom interaction. Um, separately, uh, in the teacher education literature, there's another ongoing discussion around the idea of high leverage teaching practices. Um, so these are defined as the kind of uh, fundamental high frequency practices uh, that all novice teachers would need to be equipped with when entering the classroom. Uh, there is as yet no common framework for identifying these kinds of practices. Um, so here is where I think CA uh, can make a valuable contribution um, by providing a means of empirically identifying and describing in detail what teachers do and how they do it. Uh, so for instance, leading a classroom discussion uh, is one practice that's been discussed as a high leverage teaching practice. 
and eliciting and responding to student contributions would be uh, component practices of that. Um, as the current study suggests, eliciting participation and responding can involve even uh, smaller practices. We can go to a, a finer level of detail and notice things such as how um, teachers might connect and bind student contributions. How do they do that? Or how do they split resources to accomplish different actions like validating a contribution while also moving on to the next speaker? So by turning a CA lens to actual classroom interaction and by um, potentially connecting these separate discussions, um, I think uh, further specification of teacher practices could be achieved, offering um, what I hope is useful information for, for, for novice teachers and teacher educators. Um, I really see it as a way of making what often seem to be very abstract recommendations like build rapport with students. Um, how do we make those concrete and actionable? Um, how can that be implemented in the, in the choices that teachers make in their talk um, as they're interacting with students? Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, some limitations of, of the current study as well, which offer avenues for uh, further research. Uh, the nature of the current study, so which, which just takes a snapshot of interaction in several classes, uh, doesn't enable us to examine how practices like these might be used in the long term. And we also aren't able to make the connection between these specific practices and particular learning outcomes for the students. Uh, in addition, a, a CA study doesn't provide us with access to uh, student reports of their experiences. Um, so while we might find evidence of engagement in uh, students' verbal and nonverbal participation, we can't comment on students' uh, subjective experiences of being part of those classrooms. Uh, so ultimately, the practices uncovered in a, in a CA study are perhaps best viewed as uh, possibilities. So possibilities um, to be investigated further with other methods, um, potentially in other contexts, and, and perhaps over time as well. And I do think questions like some of those noted above could be addressed in interesting ways um, through a mixed methods approach. So combining um, the close analysis of discourse um, that CA requires with um, perhaps ethnographic methods um, to get at teacher and student experiences as well. Uh, ultimately, I think what I most hope that teachers and teacher educators might take away from work like this is an awareness that um, achieving big goals in the classroom starts with how teachers manage uh, micro moments of classroom interaction. And, and so I wanted to share uh, this quote also from uh, Holland Smotrova's work, and they write, uh, the ways teachers make use of the multiple semiotic resources available to them are influential to shaping the forms of students' participation. Uh, this, they can turn a classroom into either a jointly accomplished enterprise or a lonely pursuit of separate individuals. Uh, so I think for teachers, there is real power in becoming aware of the range of, of really subtle tools that we have at our disposal um, and the ways in which we can shape the course of interaction. We can use those tools um, in ways that will best address the needs of our students. Uh, so thank you very much for your, your attention uh, and I'll look forward to your, your comments and questions.